right, so I'd like to uh, welcome my colleague Lotte Marie uh, to take us through the next uh, piece of the discussions. Thanks so much, uh, Beryl. And hi, everybody. Welcome to the session. Um, I'm really happy I get to talk to you about the opportunities and the barriers of women's financial inclusion. Uh, so we basically frame our discussion today. Um, now, I'm very aware, or we are very aware, that many of you in this call are actually financial inclusion experts yourself. So we thought instead of starting by bombarding you with all these facts and figures, it might be nice to actually just start with some Zoom polls to test our knowledge, see where we are at as the start of the framing. So we thought of three questions for you that my colleague uh, Nicolette will now launch also as a poll. So let me quickly take you through them. So the first question is about uh, what percentage of women owned SMEs in low income markets have inadequate or no access to financial services? So really women owned SMEs access to financial services. The second one is about what percentage of women in low income markets have a bank account. And then the third one is about how big is the gender gap in mobile internet usage in low and middle income countries. So you should be seeing the poll right now. So just take a bit of time. Don't be afraid to give the wrong answer. We won't grade you for this. Uh, you can fill it in, submit, and uh, let's have a look at uh, what you all think. So I see many of you are still thinking. So I'll just give you some time before we uh, look at how you did. Can I see half of you? Fill in. All right, maybe ten more seconds for those of you who are wrecking their brains right now. All right, Nicolette, I suggest we, uh, we share the results. So let's have a look at what you answered. So for the first one, you are saying, well, half of you are thinking 70%. Uh, others think 25 or 55. Second one, most think 23% of the percentages of women that have a bank account. And for the final one, you think the gender gap in mobile internet usage is 34%. Interesting. Well, let's have a look at the, the results, shall we? So the first one is actually 70%. So half of you uh, uh, got it right. So if you let this number sink in, that 70% of uh, women-led SMEs don't have uh, adequate uh, or no access to financial services, that is a very depressing number, right? Especially considering that SMEs form the backbone of so many of the economies that we work in. Um, and it's actually that 38% um, of all the SMEs, formal SMEs, are run by women. So 70% of that is a huge number. And the report that we put on the slide here actually calculated that that equates to 287 billion USD in credit defici uh, deficit uh, or deficit annually. So that's a huge number. And on one end, it's a bit depressing. On the other hand, it's also a very good opportunity for financial institutions. So now let's look at the second one, the bank accounts. So it's actually a bit better than most of you thought. So it's 65% and this number is growing. So, I mean, there are also a lot of positive ha things happening in the sector, uh, but still consider that men own 72%, uh, have 72% of men have bank accounts. So there's still a gender gap of 7%. So although it's not huge, it's still there. So that's good to realize. Now, if we look at the gender gap actually in uh, internet usage, it's 23%. So it is not as bad as some of you thought, but still 23% is very substantial, uh, especially since digital financial services are gaining ground and uh, more people are focusing on it. And of course, it has a lot of advantages for women, but think about this gender gap uh, when designing products for, for women because you might be leaving women uh, behind as well. So I think we can, let me just try to get the poll out of my screen. All right, so these numbers um, are pretty daunting, 
but at the same time, uh, they're a little bit abstract, right? So what I want to do right now is to see if we can make them a little bit more practical. And the way we want to do that is by looking at the persona of the, the lady who you see in the picture. Well, her name is Chika, and she is a small scale farmer uh, that lives in rural Nigeria. And she currently has no access to financial services. And we want to take you through some of the barriers of why that is. Well, first of all, I want to talk to you about social and cultural norms. So Chika has her children, she has her grandchildren, she has her uh, house that she needs to clean, she needs to cook. So basically, she's spending a lot of time on unpaid care duties, right? Which makes it hard for her to travel far to a branch of a bank and conduct her, uh, conduct her business there. So uh, she also has a mobility constraint uh, because she don't have access to personal transport, uh, public transport is not always reliable and um, the time and mobility are very related because when we talk to a lot of women in Nigeria, many of them told us, well, we actually have to go be back at a certain time to also serve our husband's tea or make them dinner. So it's all very related. Um, she also has limited decision making power because although she's a small scale farmer and she conducts her business, it's actually her husband who takes care of the financial side of things. Um, and also she, you could think of her safety concerns. So if she has to travel far and maybe come back late, what does that do to her safety risk? So that's also all social and cultural norms. Now you could also think of her resources. We already talked about uh, having a mobile phone, a smartphone or access to the internet. Well, Chica actually doesn't have those. Um, her business is informal, which makes it harder to register for financial services to apply for them. Um, she also doesn't have a formal ID and she doesn't have any collateral because her husband is the one who owns the land that she works on. So that's all related to resources. Now, if you look at her knowledge and skills, which is another category, she um, actually might not know what financial services are out there. Uh, what are the options? What are the, 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 the selection criteria? Does she meet them? Yes or no. Um, she also has limited financial literacy or in general literacy. Uh, so that's all on the side of Chica, but then also if you look at the, the offering, the financial services, they're often gender blind. They don't take into account all these issues that we just discussed. Um, or for example, to make it practical, they might not consider movable property as collateral. They only want to see a title deed in the form of land, which men are more likely to have. There could also be a lot of uh, sexual stereotyping when having to deal with bank officials. I can't tell you how many women we talk to in our projects that are saying, especially when you're in agriculture, when I talk to a bank official, they simply tell me you're a woman, you shouldn't be in agriculture, right? Or they actually place the risk higher because you're a woman. So these are all barriers that are very relevant. But you might now be thinking, OK, this is a lot of barriers for only one woman. And you're right that this, of course, differs a lot, right? Per country, per region, per community, per household, probably even per individual. So what we like to do at Bob Inc. is before we design our financial inclusion uh, programs uh, that we work on, we like to do these gender needs assessment, gender lens needs assessments. And um, what we did is actually we borrowed uh, these six categories based on a publication by KIT, the Royal Tropical Institute. And they made uh, this really cool conceptual framework on women's uh, empowerment for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So if you haven't read it, please check it out. I, I'm really in love with it. Um, and what we did is we took their six categories and then translated them to women's entrepreneurship and made them very practical and look at how to apply this to women entrepreneurs. So we look at all the things we already mentioned, right? So decision-making power in her home, collective action is more, can she connect with peers to stand up against uh, some of the issues that are bothering her in her business or injustices that are happening? Leadership is then, can she lead and mentor other women? The resources, well, we already talked about mobile phones, internet, but it could also be her time. Uh, critical consciousness is about um, her belief in herself. So does she actually believe women entrepreneurs can be equally successful as male entrepreneurs? How are her confidence levels, uh, her self-efficacy, all of that? And then last but not least, her bodily integrity. So this is really about her health, her safety, her support, her stress levels, all these things. So we try to take all of this into account to have a solid basis when we start designing our solutions as Bob Inc. 
Now, this is all the barriers on the side of the customer, but now we want to talk to you about the opportunity. Uh, and the whole session is, of course, about the opportunity that female micro entrepreneurs bring as agents that sell financial services. Now, here you see such an agent. Her name is Uwe. She uh, also lives in rural Nigeria, and uh, she actually is, a, is an agent because she's selling uh, FMCG products, so fast moving consumer goods. So those are the products that you see around her. She is also selling solar lights uh, with a pay as you go scheme. And she has her own hairdressing salon. So that is the case of Uwe. Now, we wanted to see if we could work with Uwe to also start selling financial uh, services, uh, because we think that's a huge opportunity. So in general, I think agents working with agents offering financial services or digital financial services is a huge opportunity, whether it's a man or a woman, right? Because um, it's more accessible for customers. They don't have to travel far anymore. It's convenient. Uh, they can do, reduce their travel costs. And often these agents are operating in their own locality where they live. So you can increase uh, customer loyalty. But there's actually also a gender lens to it, a gender aspect. Um, because what we see in literature, but also just from our own experience in our programs, is that women simply trust other women. And of course, there are exceptions to that rule, but in general, we see that. So the trust that is created between a micro uh, agent and a customer means that you will include more women into your uh, business model, into your program. So apart from that, because of that trust, we see that also higher amounts could be transferred, like higher amounts of money because of a woman dealing with a woman. Also, it can help to get more honest feedback from your female customers on the surface. Does it actually help them? How does it need to be changed for, for it to work for them? The other way around, it can also help to get more insights into your female customers, their lifestyle, their household dynamics. What do they use your product for? What other products could you be offering them? So we think that's the huge opportunity working with women that sell to other women. At the same time, it could also offer again some barriers because Uwe as a female micro agent or micro entrepreneur might also have limited mobility right, like we saw with Chica as well. Uh, she might have limited starting capital or working capital. And also very important, like an agent like Uwe might be selling from a shop, so from a stable place, or she might be going door to door selling to the community. But if you go door to door, we've learned that the risk of harassment actually increases quite a bit. So how are you handling that? Then also what happens with gender-based violence at home? Because we tend to assume that if a woman earns more income, she has more decision-making power. So gender-based violence actually goes down the risk of it. But that is a little bit too simplistic. And there is a lot of different research out there that can show that it could also be the other way around. So are you aware of that? And how do you deal with that in your programs? Now, I talked a lot about Uwe, uh, but I think it would be nice if you can hear directly from her. So we actually want her to tell something about her business herself. So we have this nice uh, video about her. And just bear in mind that this is a video about Uwe before she started selling financial services. So she will tell you about her selling FMCG products, solar, and her hairdressing salon. But it's just so you get to know her, uh, her business, and also her really cool personality. So let's have a look. Everybody needs solar in their lives. <laughs> Even you, yes you, you think you have good lights now? You see nothing, my friend. <laughs> Once you go solar, all other options are over. My name is Mrs. Uwe, a top seller of solar in Osun State, here in Nigeria. I'm a mother, a businesswoman, and a air saloon owner. Good afternoon, everybody. Uwe is one of 30 female door-to-door, -door, D2D, who has been selected as a top FMCG sales agent to be trained and supported to sell high-impact products in addition to her portfolio using pay-as-you-go technology. Adding durables like solar products or cookstoves to her basket helped Uwe's business to get even better, selling more FMCG than ever before so Uwe, what's the big deal? 
Why are you having so much success? What kind of question is that? I'm a hard-headed businesswoman. But more to the point, people need access to clean lights and energy that is affordable. Money doesn't grow on trees, you know, but solar energy does come from the sky. <laughs> so what's the setup for your customer? They can pay bit by bit. Pay as you go, which is really helpful for family. And you, what's your stake? The more I sell, the more profit I make. And it's flexible around my other job. I can buy clothes for my son and tools for my hairdressing business. Learning and scaling. Over the next five years, D2D is set to reach 10,000 sales agents and 1 million households. Any tips, Uwe? Let there be life. And you better make sure it's solar. <laughs> The B2D project has taken place with the support of Transform, a unique innovation fund, flexible so the project can be adapted as things come to light. You should not let the water touch it. The water should not touch it. All right. Let me see if we can, yes. So the big question, I hope uh, uh, we now finished a bit of the framing because the, the big question for you today is how might female micro entrepreneurs like Uwe, like uh, the, the cool lady you just uh, got to know a bit better, drive financial inclusion of women at the last mile. So women like Chica, who we discussed earlier. Now, you probably already thought about a lot of these questions, right? Because many of you in this call are dealing with this on a daily basis. So I doubt whether I actually told you something that you didn't know already. So what we now want to do is also hear from you. How are you dealing with some of these barriers uh, in your programs, in your companies? Um, because there is not necessarily a right or wrong answer. It's just choices that you have to make. So let's go into one of these, what we call paradoxes of what choices do you make? And my colleague Nicolette will help me to launch a poll so you can make your choice. So Chica, so the, the customer has limited decision-making power in her home. Like we discussed, her husband is not likely to allow her to use financial services. So what do you do? Do you exclude women like Chica? I mean, I've read reports where people say, do some kind of insight study, see which women actually have decision-making power and only work with them because it will uh, actually save you a lot of money. Or will you include women like Chica also realizing that you now have to go into household dynamics. You might have to do training. You might have to do all these things or involving the husband, which will cost more time and energy. But you could say it's a responsibility because we don't want to leave anyone behind. So again, choices. So what would you do? Well, Nicolette, maybe we can give them five more seconds. And of course, this is not very nuanced, right? Like we now give you an A or B option. In reality, it's probably more nuanced, but we just kind of want to see where you are at on the spectrum. Um, and then also, if you want to explain your choice, please also put it in the chat and we will also have more time to discuss this in the breakout rooms. So let's end the poll and have a look at the results. So the majority of you would say we include women like Chica and 9% uh, of you say we exclude. So this is very interesting because when you include women like Chica, we would love to hear from you how you do it and also how you make sure your business case still works in your programs. But more about that later. Let's do another one. So the next one is actually about uh, using a feature phone. So Chica, again, the customer we talked about, uses a feature phone and rarely access the internet as it is too expensive. What would you do? So would you then design your financial service toward feature phones and offline use? Um, or do you say, I have to come up with some sort of scheme so I can actually offer Chica a smartphone with low cost internet access? Again, both have advantages and disadvantages. These are some of the choices we have to make. So I see a lot of comments coming in. Again, there might be a middle ground here, but we just wanna see uh, how you feel about it. And please type into the chat if you have anything to say about your choice. 
and my colleagues will uh, will respond to you as well. All right. Should we end the poll, uh, Nicolette? Okay, this is interesting. So 70% say design the financial service toward feature phones and offline use, and then 30% uh, we need to offer a scheme to offer smartphones and internet. It's already a little bit more divided, right? So I, I'm, I'm already feeling some good discussions coming up for the breakout sessions. Um, last one is about uh, the feeling of safety. So UE is more likely to experience safety issues when selling door to door and gender-based violence could increase when their income increases, like we talked about. So what, do, what would you do? Would you run your program, run your business, do nothing and feel like, okay, you know what? It's her responsibility if she joins my program. And this is now about the agent, right? Uwe is the agent. If she joins my program, it's up to her to decide what, does, what that does to her personally. So I would not do anything. It's too uh, complicated. Or would you start investing in prevention and redress efforts? So you could do, um, I don't know, like anonymous reporting mechanisms. You could do trainings. You could offer options for agents to work in small groups. So they, there is more safety. I mean, there might be a million other uh, possibilities, but they all cost money and all cost time, right? Well, you're also trying to build a business case. So what would you do? Um, let's look at the results. If that's okay. Yes. Okay, so 96% says investing for prevention and redress efforts. So we're very curious to hear what you did uh, in all of this. Um, this is actually the end of the framing discussion. I think you now heard a lot of theory. We heard a, a little bit from you, but it will be interesting to now look at an actual case and hear how they dealt with all these barriers. But first, let me hand the floor back to my colleague, uh, Beryl, to introduce the next sec section. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lotte Marie. Thanks for setting the schedule uh, for the discussions. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Emmanuel Aga. I don't know if he's on the call so that he can uh, dis uh, share with us the case from Nigeria. Hi, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Emmanuel here from Lagos, Nigeria. You can hear me? Loud and clear, Emmanuel. Okay, great. All right, so I mean, um, thank you again, uh, Lord Marie, for that excellent presentation. I mean, um, it's always a pleasure to hear you talk about these things with so much passion. Um, Innovatives is the name of the company and we run a last mile financial services in Nigeria. And uh, I mean, we were incorporated some eight years ago We licensed by the central bank to offer agency banking services to the last mile and also help small businesses to digitize. He's on the ground. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me still? Yes, yes, Emmanuel, we can hear you. Oh, okay, all right. So I mean, I can take off the video. So I mean, so it's a lot clearer if there's an issue with the bandwidth. Um, yeah, so um, what we do here as Innovatives help small businesses um, access financial services, help household access financial services. So the experiment, we, I mean, just to give a case in point, it's the issue of gender, I mean, gender inclusion. So we find out that if you have female agents who are, you know, as part of the financial inclusion ecosystem, they can also help, you know, other female, I mean, female customers who, you know, will patronize them or can be financially included because of all the cultural and religious issues around, you know, gender-based, uh, 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 around gender, you know, in my country. So we've seen an increased uptake of women being involved in financial services because of uh, because of the fact that there are female agents offering those services. Um, today we have about 15,000 agents spread across the country offering financial services at the last mile. They know they don't only offer just cash in, cash out, and account opening. They also have this, you know, in Nigeria there's this thing called bank verification number. It's almost like a form of ID. All right, before you can be included in the in the verifications in the banking system, you need you need to have a BVN. And then you know, some you know, up north or in 
in not just up north, but in some some climes or some parts of Nigeria, you know, it's not convenient for a woman to unveil herself in order to take pictures of herself. You know, that can happen with a man being the agent. So, but we've seen that possible because women are now involved, so they can help enroll these uh, um, women into the national uh, bank verification system. This number is also now being used for the national ID. So we're helping women not just get financial services, but get into the, you know, get included into the national uh, identity system. And then other possibilities are now uh, uh, possible for them within the ecosystem. Now, we've also seen an issue where there's lack of capital, all right? You know, I mean, again, you know, um, the, the, there's, women are likely not to have access to adequate capital in order to run their business. And so what we've done is design a credit scheme where we, you know, we help this agent to access capital and then use that to run their business. Um, the issue of technology, you know, keep coming up. Okay, um, should we design technology that are fit for feature phones or should we just, you know, um, you know, should we exclude these women who are largely using feature phone and all that when most of the cutting edge technologies are on smartphones? So we also have a, a device financing scheme that helps to, you know, help them acquire these smartphones and can be, you can, you know, the agents are, they're being trained on how to use it by our female DSA direct sales there are DSAs dealing with the last mile agent, supporting them with training, capacity building, and holding them to be able to get used to using those, those feature phones. And they're really not as complex as they, as, as they look like, you know. And then these feature phones now become useful also to, you know, at home. Their children can use them for academic purposes and for other things, you know, uh, messaging and other things that are possible. So it's not just to say design feature phone related applications for this one, but they also you're limiting them to possibilities that the smartphone can bring on board. Now, the issue of gender violence is something that, you know, we encounter from time to time, both at home and, you know, as these agents go about serving you know, the, um, you know, financial services. So we've put mechanisms in place. Some, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, you know, we, we don't, you know, we allow this a female agent operate in market clusters as against door to door so that they are, they are, they're not, they're not exposed to any form of violence or danger or danger. So operating in open markets where, I mean, it's not very easy for anyone to harass or molest them. That also has seen, you know, us being able to curb that whole uh, gender violence thing. And also introducing value added or add-on um, incentives that will make the, the husband at home to support the woman, you know. So things like health insurance that the family can all benefit from. So, the, you know, the husband can now begin to support this the, uh, the, the female entrepreneur because there's something she's bringing home that, they, you know, that everybody at home benefits from. So those are some of the incentives that we've introducing our program to be able to cut, you know, gender-based violence, especially at the home front. So these are some of the things that we've done, access to capital, access to market, all right? So we're launching a marketplace um, before the end of the year that would enable these small businesses to sell outside their zip code, all right? We're very excited about this program because it gives them access to new markets, access to new customer base, and potentially will also lift up their, you know, their, their income you know, and be able to do other things in the society. These are some of the ways that, you know, we've put, you know, our activity as the last my financial service provider is helping women, you know, um, be part of the financial uh, service ecosystem. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. And I can see uh, questions coming in the chat. So just keep posting your questions on the chat box and then uh, my colleagues uh, will pick them up and uh, we'll see how to discuss them in the breakout sessions. Maybe uh, there's yeah. just maybe one that came through that perhaps, uh, well, two, I think that we can maybe just quickly touch on if that's okay. Um, the one was a question, Emmanuel, where do they get the capital? Do they advance them floats for transacting? Um, and then uh, the second one was, uh, are there any companies throughout Africa who hire or train agents? And then SGBs can contract for agents. So perhaps, uh, Emmanuel, if those two questions are clear, you can maybe briefly uh, touch on them. All right. Thank you.
I think we lost you, Emmanuel. So yes, uh, India, I can see your subsidiary. All right, we to these female agents, um, you know, so we we'll give them float, advance them float for their transactions. Yeah, so that's, that's how we cater for that. You know, we also have um, partners who also on lend to them through our microfinance subsidiaries. That way we're able to keep, you know, to, to what that does for us is that because we see their transaction throughput, decision-making is a lot easier. And then because we also earn income from these agents, And through their agency banking activity, affordable for them to be, you know, um, it's something that they can cope with because there's an additional income for us from their own or uh, from their day-to-day -day financial services. Yes, there are companies in Africa who are training, uh, uh, who can be contracted to train some of these um, um, uh, field agents. You know, but, but I must be honest with you, from experience, it had not worked out for us. Um, we've had to outsource that whole training and handholding you know, to some of these outsourcing companies. And the experience, um, the, the, the outcome was not exactly what we anticipated. So what we've done is to now recruit our own last mile. We call them, you know, DSAs or direct sales agents who are the ones actually, you know, interacting with this, uh, with this agent training and holding, helping them with, you know, answering their questions, issue resolution and all that. And our results are better because, you know, there's something I've come to understand, especially doing business in Africa. You don't go to war with another man's soldier, all right? You need to go, you need to go to war with your own army. And, you know, um, training our own last mile support agents who are supporting these small businesses. We've gotten a lot more mileage out of it than our initial outsourcing experience. So it's just something for you to note out there. Uh, that's for Kali, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, and please keep uh, um, putting your questions on the chat uh, and we'll uh, respond to them uh, where uh, it's possible or we can bring those questions back into the breakout sessions. I'd like to now uh, call upon my colleague, Nicolette Law, who is the financial uh, lead at Book Inc to set the stage for the ideation sessions that we'll be going into later. Right. Thanks so much, uh, Beryl. Also, Emmanuel, for sharing the interesting uh, practical examples. So what I'm going to do now is just for a couple of minutes, set the stage uh, for the ideation that we'll, we will be moving in shortly. So these are a few concepts that you will be using so you can keep them in mind. Um, so firstly, uh, what makes financial inclusion work for women? So we can say that women are really financially included, not only when they have access to financial solutions, but also when they, or rather when they adopt it and they're using it repeatedly to achieve outcomes. So whether that is capturing new opportunities for themselves or their family, uh, building resilience or being better and able to meet their basic needs. So adoption is enabled by three things, and you can see that on the screen. So the firstly is the solution itself. Secondly, it is getting the solution to where women can conveniently and affordably access it. And lastly, positioning it in a way that's attractive to her and supporting her at each step to build the new behavior and make it part of her day-to-day -day life. So if you move on uh, to the next slide... At Bob Inc., we have developed the Big Idea Framework uh, to actually achieve this uh, in the financial inclusion work that we do. And the framework is, uh, is interestingly a result of work we've done together with Emmanuel uh, and Innovectives in uh, Nigeria called Door to Door Pro. So that's also the video uh, you saw of UWE, where we were working to uh, transform these uh, agents into DFS agents as well. And we were testing that together. So the framework has two sections. Firstly, we always look at uh, the insights gathering and Lotte Marie spoke to much of this. It's understanding what are the current behaviors and the intended behaviors, looking at what are the insights we have about the woman and her financial life, um, and also those of the people that would influence her. Thirdly, looking at what are some of the benefits uh, that would appeal to her as a strong value proposition. And then lastly, doing the gender lens needs assessment that, uh, that Lotte Marie spoke about. We then take all of these insights into a, a design sprint. So today we're going to do that really short in, in about 30 minutes. Normally we would do this either over two sessions, over two days, uh, or condense into a, to a full day workshop um, in, in a format like that. We go through four different components. 
And uh, firstly, it is around the idea. So thinking together, what can be the campaign to drive awareness and creating the demand uh, of the solution? This is both demand from the agent, but also demand from uh, the, the user. Um, at the end. Secondly, looking at the design, so making sure that we have an intuitive and engagement model and also then specifically the technology uh, that they will be interfacing with. Third is looking at the experience, so that is facilitating everything from the very first use but also encouraging repeat use. And then lastly, we look at activation that's more broadly looking at uh, the user's peers, but also the community around that, making sure that there's sufficient support, but also that the women can be enabled to actually be advocates of the solution. Um, as Bob Inc., we've then also compiled what we feel are best practice, best practice examples to be followed uh, for each of these. Um, and we can share the point of view, perhaps uh, my colleague Rose co-authored that with me. She's also in the session. Perhaps, Rose, you can share the link uh, to the article as well if people want to have a look. So I just wanted to share four examples. And I think uh, Emmanuel already did a really brilliant uh, job of, of highlighting really inspiring examples. But to illustrate what we mean with each of these four. So firstly, if we look at idea. One of the things that can uh, can uh, actually cause women to disqualify themselves from being a potential user of credit is the assumption or often the reality that collateral is required. Um, and in emerging markets, collateral is often in the name of the husband. So uh, Unilever has partnered with MasterCard and KCB to introduce collateral free credit that uses Unilever purchase history in the place of collateral. So this is also then really uh, visibly communicated to the MS SMEs to ensure that it would apply appeal broadly, um, also to the stores and women that do not have collateral. Secondly, if we look at design, an example that really inspires us is the Paytm Soundbox. Now, this is interesting because, as we heard earlier, there is still a gap, uh, not only in general literacy, but also financial literacy between men and women. So what this device does is that when a payment is made, it would then audibly confirm uh, with voice, hence a Soundbox, that the payment has been made. And interestingly, uh, right now, the National Payments uh, Corporation of India is uh, that developed uh, the UPI solution is also testing a voice based payment service for feature phone users in low connectivity zones. So that will be interesting to watch out for. Third, around the experience. So something that would often hinder repeat use um, and trigger a fallback to cash is the ability to transact with users from different banks and different wallets. Um, and while this is still a constraint in many markets, uh, Zona has partnered with their fintech partner at uh, Tilt, um, and Zona runs a network of DFS agents in Zambia. And so they have introduced uh, a solution with which uh, the users and the agents can transact with different banks. Lastly, when we look at activations, this is actually an example of uh, where we've worked with Unilever to enable their Shakti agents um, to pay and order digitally. Uh, what we find is that most of these shops or many of these shops, the women do not operate in isolation. More often than not, it's actually with the husband or with other family members. So it's really a family business. So what we've done there um, in enabling uh, the woman to use the digital solutions is to also enable the other people working in the store than often the husband or a different family member so that they can also then all um, support each other. Um, in activating the solution. So that just gives you a bit of a flavor of what you can think of for each of these different uh, areas. So now we're going to get to the ideation section where we're going to be hearing from all of you. And collectively, we're going to be looking at the question, how might female micro entrepreneurs drive financial inclusion of women at the last mile? So practically how we're going to be doing that um, is I will be shortly splitting you into four different groups and each of these groups will be discussing one key question. Um, the groups will also then be facilitated by our Bob Inc. team. So you will have a facilitator and a note taker there that can facilitate the discussion. Um, so let's just see. So the first group will be looking at the question, how might we attract more women like Chica, the customer with no or limited experience with financial services to either become an agent banker herself or to use the agent banking services as a user? The second group would be looking more at the design of the solution. So asking how might we design an agent banking model that makes it simple, seamless and risk free um, for Uwe and Chica. 
the group that Trisha will be facilitating will be looking at how might we provide the infrastructure and support required at each step for Uwe and Chica, Chica while keeping the cost of the model manageable always a, a, a tough question. Um, and then lastly, the activation group will be looking at how might we leverage existing community structures to ensure that we don't leave women like Chica with lower levels of literacy or restrictive household dynamics behind. So I will shortly open up the breakout. Um, if you land in a group where you feel that you don't have much of a contribution to make, you would much rather participate in one of the other discussions, uh, you feel free to come back to the plenary and I can then move you out. Um, we would remain in the breakout groups for roughly 30 minutes um, and they'll take you through uh, yeah, four different steps. But let me not share too much, keep it a bit, uh, bit uh, exciting as well for you. Um, let me open that out and then I'll see you back here in 30 minutes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with my group. Unfortunately, uh, we got uh, cut out as we were just uh, discussing uh, the juicy parts of our, of our, of our key uh, takeouts. But I think what was important for us uh, just going through uh, uh, the session was that segmenting the women uh, and understanding the different segments of the women uh, is what would then lead to you know, a, a proper uh, design uh, and also to help them um, experience this uh, digital uh, financial, uh, the formal digital financial services, uh, because then we can't, we, we can't just talk about women as one big group, but in there, there are different segments. So the segmentation uh, for us uh, came out as a very strong uh, point that uh, would then uh, help us with a proper uh, ideation for, for the women. Uh, can I ask uh, Muntasir to share from his group? Yeah, sure. I think I was the second group, but like I can go with it. Uh, um, basically, my group participated and thought about how to design more effective products uh, for the women and how we can include more women uh, in the process of doing so. So I have um, uh, consolidated these uh, outputs in three bullets. So number one was like uh, to ensure the access how we can design a product like which can be accessible who do not have a mobile phone which is a smart one or it is a featured phone. So rather than not looking forward to probably a, a smart application, so a simple USSD or IVR, even SMS based financial service which can be accessed by this phone already will uh, remove some of the barrier to entry. So this could be one. On the other hand, like how we can reach our customers. So uh, we found like our group suggested to use the existing channels that is already there in the vicinity. By that, what uh, I am trying to mean is like the women entrepreneurs already probably doing some sort of business. Probably they have access to door to door or maybe they are running a micro retail outlet. So these becomes kind of the touch points and they basically leverage it to their existing and probably new customers and they offer the financial uh, services and the financial products to their customer. The other thing we discussed is around the um, collateral and the collateral was like how we can also mitigate the issue of uh, asking for collaterals when we are trying to offer a credit uh, service especially. So as we often see, like the assets are probably with the husband. So to mitigate it, maybe initially we offer small ticket sizes. So by offering small ticket sizes, we can already explore like who are already uh, trying those products and uh, definitely looking into the repayments and the other things. Uh, we can basically offer more larger uh, ticket sizes going forward. That's how probably we can reduce the barrier of collateral when we are trying to have new acquisition. And definitely a few other comments came in, which are like when we are designing this product, not only to consider the women's and also only their needs, and also to reduce the issues of violence and or, or the like disagreements, probably to include the husbands also during the talks. So that's how we take care of the culture and the local context parts. So these were the uh, summary uh, from my group. Thank you, Beryl. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Montesir. Uh, can I ask Krisha to go next? 
Sure. So I was with the group um, on experience. So how could we provide the support required for each step for Uwe and Chica while keeping costs of the model manageable? So we talked a lot about sort of, are there cases out there, commercially viable models to um, for financial inclusion in the last mile? And I think um, we talked uh, about the importance of leveraging existing infrastructure um, to basically make these models more viable. So, you know, government regulations around interoperability and these agents being, you know, people being able to, um, you know, transfer money between wallets from one provider to the wallet of another provider, or also, um, you know, different, um, different bank providers, um, which basically sort of helps to, I think, piggyback on you know the agent infrastructure and make these these models leaner and meaner um uh, and there's an interesting case i think from the post office in india uh where they've basically leveraged the post office who has uh um postal workers all over india to actually become um dfs agents um themselves as well so interesting i think interesting case and i think cgap actually has a, a publication related to that we talked a bit about how do you address the the sort of unpaid care burden and um i think at least my takeaway was it's it's challenging to do it in a purely commercially viable model but um you know there's social enterprise models that are out there and un women's doing some interesting work as well to see how how can companies collectively address unpaid care thanks trisha yeah uh Lotte marie sure you... thanks so much yeah. uh Beryl. Uh, so our group uh, focused on activation and the question, how can we leverage existing structures to ensure that we don't leave women behind like uh, Chica? And it's interesting that our uh, discussion was very similar to what I already heard in the design group and also in the experience group. So just to summarize it quickly then, also looking at time, is that we talked a lot about the social structure, so working with role models like existing group structures, for example, the family, like Chica is, of course, um, 58 years old, so she's likely to have already more grown children. So instead of uh, targeting Chica with your model or with your marketing, you could also have a look at uh, uh, targeting her children and then her children helping her to get included. Um, there was something about basically the structure around language and current experience of a woman like Chica. So instead of saying, for example, with a savings product, like, oh, but this will save you this and this and much uh, money, can you actually change the language to what she's used to? So um, with familiar aspects in her life, so actually you can save uh, enough to buy ABCD that uh, you would want to buy at the end of the month. Uh, and then finally, um, we talked about digital structure. So also looking at if Chica has a feature phone and no access to the internet, could we then not design like a USSD type surface or work with an existing surface that uses also USSD like uh, M-Pesa uh, to then uh, include her in uh, your program or in your uh, business model? So I think these were the main three points that were very similar also to what I heard uh, discussed in the other groups. Thank you so much, Lotte Marie. Uh, and I'd just like to ask uh, that uh, if there are specific follow-up uh, or potential collaboration areas that uh, we see uh, that you'd want to get connected uh, to, uh, then please uh, link uh, with the BOP team, uh, Lotte Marie and Nicolette uh, as our main contact uh, persons uh, for this topic. Uh, and also uh, don't miss our, our session on Thursday. It's going to be on a circular agribusiness. Um, uh, so yeah, so also there we are looking at the topic on how to make the most out of food. And it's uh, very interesting uh, to see uh, how we are scaling a circular business in Africa. So I don't have uh, any further <laughs> uh, things to discuss. I don't know if uh, there's anything else uh, from uh, my team members, Nicolette or Lete Marie. Otherwise we thank you very much for your participation and for your full attention uh, as we had requested when we had started. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much everyone. Um, please do catch us on other sessions as well. Uh, this was the 13th uh, Sankalp Global Summit. 
uh, the session was micro and mighty, and I hope you've gotten as much information as you wanted to get from this session and look forward to seeing you in the future sessions. Thank you.